Hi there, this is David and welcome to the Top 10 Best JRPG Party Members Part 2. Here, we're not going to be looking at main characters at all. We're only going to be looking at characters that join up later, but are so good that they actually outshine the main hero himself. If you missed the first part, please check the link in the video description, and let's get started looking at the cream of the crop. Number 10, Fee of the Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel series. When I first started playing RPGs, evasion tanks just didn't exist. Yeah, you had your fast characters such as thieves and fighters in Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior respectively, and then you had people like Edge, Shadow, and Locke on the SNES, but they really didn't evade all that much more than the average character. It wasn't until quite recently that the archetype really came into full swing. I think that I first experienced it with Dunban in Xenoblade, but Fee brings it to a whole other level. With only a few quartz modifications, she's able to dodge just about anything that comes her way, and she's amazing in battle too. She's one of the first characters that has access to large group hitting skills, clearing out randoms with ease, and she pretty much always goes first, so all the rest of the team has to do is mop up after her. Add to the fact that she's essentially unkillable in boss fights, and you've got a tiny little powerhouse on your hands. Number 9, Pekko of Breath of Fire 3. Earlier we saw Rei who just beats them all, but now we're going to be shining a spotlight on the much maligned Onion. As a lifelong fan of RPGs, I played this game when it first came out, and I was flabbergasted when I saw a lot of people trashing him on the game FAQ's message boards. They were basically saying that he was useless, only good as a skill mule and preferring to use the bottom tier god-awful Nina and Gar. I never knew why, because he was always a staple powerhouse in my party. The Little Onion starts off at level 1, which is quite the blessing because of the master system. With minimal effort apprenticing to strength-based masters, he easily becomes the absolute strongest character in the game with naturally high growths in HP and defense along with innate regeneration and the highest repraisal rate to boot. His only weakness is the speed, but since he'll be countering everything anyway, does it really matter? Number 8, Meru of Legend of Dragoon. It's kind of funny living through the evolution of the speed stat. In earlier turn-based titles, it just let the guy go first. But the invention of the active time battle system in Final Fantasy IV spawned many more innovative battle systems which grant extra turns based upon speed. This really puts Saiten and Rei on the map in their respective games, and the same can be said for Meru in Legend of Dragoon. While her other stats like HP and Strength do leave a bit to be desired, she has the highest speed along with fantastic magic. So with just a modicum of additional speed boosting equipment, she will be hitting quite literally three to four times for everybody else's one turn, allowing her to just crush the opposition with magical items, multiple attacks, or in a pinch, healing up the party in her dragoon form. With that many turns, she can quite literally own the battle and do whatever she wants. Number 7, Peter of Shining Force 2. Don't you just love it when games hand you the win the game button on a silver platter? Well, that's what happens with Peter here. He's kind of like Amaro on steroids, an uncontrollable, unstoppable wrecking ball slamming into the opposing army constantly. Just looking at him though, you would think that the Dodo would be like a joke character like Yogurt or Kiwi, but this small wonder gets great stat gains and later on when he class changes, he'll become even better because as a phoenix, not only does he have the ability to fly, making all the terrain obstacles obsolete, but he automatically revives when he dies too. And if that's not enough, he even gains natural resistance to fire, and his one weakness, his uncontrollability, falls to the wayside after Volcanon as well. Number 6, Princess Toadstool of Super Mario RPG. Could somebody tell me why she gets kidnapped so often when she's the strongest character in the entire game? As I've shown before on the worst characters lists, Bowser is a bottom of the barrel basic bitch, while Toadstool just wrecks the competition and we're supposed to believe that she's a damsel in distress? Girl, get real. 
even if all she had going for her was her group hug, she would still probably be a staple on my team, but she's so much more than that. She can attack right up there with the best of them, and later, with Lazy Shell, she's pretty much invincible. I know some of you in the comments are going to argue that Jeno is better, but really, think about this. Could you beat Culex without Jeno? Absolutely. But could you beat him without Princess Toadstool? I don't think so. Number 5. Kina of Final Fantasy IX Kina reminds me a lot of Peiko. People just seem to write it off as a joke without a second thought, and I don't really know why. Blue Mages have always been one of my favorite classes in the Final Fantasy series. The first one that I played was Strago, who honestly wasn't the best Blue Mage ever. But then, when I played the translated Final Fantasy V and absolutely steamrolled everything in my path with the Blue Mage job, I knew I had a winner. Kina may be annoying, but if you give it just a little bit of time and effort, it can seriously mean the difference between sliding into an easy victory or having a terrible time. It has the best survivability of all the mages, along with the most versatility, having access to both attack and healing spells, as well as the best support spells. Kina can also easily become one of the first characters to hit max damage. Just catch a bunch of frogs and drop them on your opposition. It's really that easy. Number 4, Seth, a Fire Emblem, the Sacred Stones. Here we have yet another god just handed to you on a silver platter. You quite literally begin the game with him, and if you wanted to, you could easily solo the entire game with him too. In all honesty, it might even be easier to keep everybody else away from the fighting and just send Seth, the Super Jagan, into the fray and do everybody else's dirty work. This guy has absolutely ungodly base stats to begin with and has some of the best growths in the game. He also starts off promoted as a paladin, probably the best class in the game too. Then, to make him even better, he's mounted. He can cross like half the map in one turn. It's ridiculous. Seriously, if you want to play the game on easy mode, just send Seth out in the middle of the fray and then let all the enemies target him. Then he counters and he weakens all the poor saps and then your troops just have to slaughter any remaining survivors. He's just that good. Number 3, Richard of Suikoden 5. Have you ever thought of what the Konami code might look like if it was a person? Well, Richard is your answer. Not only is he an evasion tank, able to dodge just about anything thrown his way, but he's arguably the strongest character in the game, able to even one-shot many bosses. This is all because of the way multi-hit works. The faster that your character is, the more likely he is to multi-hit, thus dealing absurd amounts of damage. We're talking over five figures here. Once you get him joining ten levels above the hero, just throw him into the front row, watch him dodge everything with impunity, then use his innate Swallow Rune, which not only deals double damage on top of his already outstanding damage, but it also has a chance for insta-kill, and it doesn't unbalance him, and it has a chance for multi-hit. Yeah, it can only be used once per battle, but whenever it ends the battle, who really cares? Number 2, Blue of Breath of Fire 2. Those of you who have been following my channel for some time should know by now that I'm old. I played Breath of Fire 2 in the pre-internet age, but I did have my trusty strategy guide by my side, so I knew of the existence of Blue. But because I was a kid, and I had tons of patience, I never really used her for the same reasons that I tried not to use Orlando or Edgar. I looked at her existence as pretty much cheating. This is because the literal Goddess is not only unkillable with super high stats and a free self-heal that can be used indefinitely, but also because she made Nina obsolete. Both Nina and Blue are the black mages of the game, but while Nina has worse all-around stats and has to slowly learn her spells through leveling up, Blue just comes with them all, starting at level 35 and able to just clean house right after you get the whale. And finally, number one, Levin of Wild Arms XF. While Richard is quite literally a hidden gem among 108 other characters, and you have to go out of your way to find Blue, which is hard to do without a guide, 
Levin, like Seth, is just handed to you only one hour into the game, and from then on, he's pretty much able to solo anything that comes his way. Many of you have probably not played this game, but let me try to explain to you why he's number one. Levin not only has the highest speed in the entire game, getting tons of turns, but whose movement range is also the largest, so he's going to be the first one to encounter many of the mobs. Then, add to the fact that he's innately armed with ranged, non-elemental, area-of-effect magic that pretty much just one-shots everything in sight, and you have a one-man killing machine. Throw some elementalist equipment on him and watch the carnage ensue. More often than not, Levin will have cleared half the field before your slower units even encounter a mob or get an attack off. It's just crazy. Well, that's it for the top 10 best JRPG party members. Please be on the lookout for part 3, because I still have some notes down for more kernels of greatness. This has been David. If you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and have a good day.